So that's how we're starting this morning. We're starting by listening to the call of the Lord to turn back to him with our whole hearts. Let us return unto the Lord. <coughs> Come, let us return unto the Lord. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Unto the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us, for he has wounded us, but he will bear. Like rain, spring rain, he will come to us like rain, spring rain. Come, let us return unto. Let us return unto the Lord. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Come, let us return. If we ask, he will come. 
This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me, and I I'm desperate for you. And I, I'm lost without you. You are the air I breathe. You are the air I breathe. Your hope. daily bread you are my daily bread your very word spoken to me and I I'm desperate for you And I, I'm lost without you. Let's pray this for ourselves corporately. And we, we're desperate for you. We're desperate for you. We're lost without you. We're desperate for you. We're lost without you. Come, Holy Spirit. 
we're hungry for you. We're thirsty for you. Isn't he beautiful? Beautiful. Isn't he Prince of Peace? Son of God, isn't he? Isn't he wonderful? Wonderful, isn't he? Counselor, Almighty God, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he? Yes, you are beautiful, beautiful. Yes, you are, Prince of Peace, Son of God, yes, you are, yes, you are, wonderful, wonderful, yes, you are. Counselor, Almighty God, yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, you are. No matter what's going on in your life or in the world around us or even in the church, Jesus is still beautiful. He's still good. He's always good. If we turn to him, he'll always give us perspective and hope. Yes, you are beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, you are. Counselor. Almighty God. Yes, you Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, among sing praises to thee among the nations for thy steadfast love is great his steadfast love never ceases he is great to the heavens and thy faithfulness thy faithfulness to the clouds be exalted O God above the heavens let thy glory Exalted, O oh God, above the heavens, let thy glory be over all the earth. And 
for the sake of his glory, he will come to us if we ask him humbly. And he will come like rain, spring rain. He will come to us like rain, spring rain. If we ask, he will come and pour his rain on everyone. If we ask, he will come and pour his rain on everyone. Everyone who asks, everyone who asks receives. For every child needs rain, spring rain. For every child needs rain, Spring rain. Amen. May the Lord bless you this morning or whenever you're watching this with a fresh hunger for his presence and a release of his Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. If you guys have your Bibles uh, with you, I'd like for you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. And as you're turning there, um, we're just going to pray, and uh, then we'll kind of launch into his word together. So let's, let's seek the Lord together in prayer uh, this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the ability to, to come before you and to worship you so openly, so freely, that we can come into your presence and we can just praise you. And there's no dividing wall. And so, Father, I pray that as, as we look to you this morning, as we continue to look to you this morning, that, Father, that we would, we would experience your, your presence that Jesus, that you would encamp us just with your glory. And that, Father, that, that your word would, would penetrate into our hearts. And that, Jesus, that as you spoke these words by your spirit through your messengers so many years ago, I pray that that, that truth that you birthed in their hearts would just would take birth in our hearts and that it would lead us closer to you. And Jesus, I, I just, I thank you for the word. May you be glorified this morning through your servant. May your word again just dive, just go deep into our, our hearts and just leading us to, to see you as glorious and beautiful and wonderful. I just pray this in Jesus' Incredible name, in the beautiful name of Jesus, amen. So, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have kind of the beginning of the Apostle Paul and his kind of address to this church concerning the spiritual gifts. Now, before we get into kind of the specifics of the passage this morning, I want to just take a moment to talk about spiritual gifts and kind of why we're moving into talking about the spiritual gifts. So we have been, um, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the Holy Spirit. Um, I guess you could say we're in a series on the Holy Spirit. We've examined kind of the new covenant promise of His presence. We've looked at the person of the Holy Spirit. We've looked at what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, what it means to be filled in the Holy Spirit, what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. And... Last week, we looked at what it means to kind of walk in the Spirit. So we've been on the Holy Spirit, and now, I guess you could say we're going to work with, we're going to move into a, 
a series within a series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the gifts are, um, are important and significant to the body of Christ. That God has given us these gifts, His church, these gifts, in order to, to be used by us. In order to encourage one another and build one another up. And so there's significance to the spiritual gifts. And obviously there are some um, within Christianity that believe that some of the gifts died away with the apostles. That term is, they call it cessationism. We as a church at Harmony are a continuationist church. We believe that all of the gifts are available to the, the saints of God and that God wants us to use those gifts for his glory and for the upbuilding of the church. And so if you, uh, if you are a cessationist, well, you're going to have to you know, phone me up and talk to me and we can, we can chat about that another time, but I'm not going to get into that this morning. But we're going to look at really the first three verses in this important section of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And, you know, when you're talking about the spiritual gifts, um, often, uh, even in my study on the spiritual gifts, most of the time you just kind of launch into to verse 4. Um, you know, where Paul says in chapter 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4, and we're going to talk about this next week, but he says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but in the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then he kind of lists, goes into listing some of the spiritual gifts. So often you'll find when it's talking about spiritual gifts, it starts there. But we need to look at these first three verses because they really are the foundation for which the rest of the gifts are kind of to operate from. And so let's look at these first kind of three verses. And... Um, I'm going to just put up the, uh, the, the PowerPoint on my phone so I'm not looking over my shoulder. Um, but the first three verses, we'll just read them together here. Starting in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of where our focus is going to be this morning. Three kind of short verses, but they are foundational and so important for the rest of what Paul's about to talk about. Now, the first thing we need to notice is that Paul says now concerning spiritual gifts. So what Paul's doing is essentially he's, he's highlighting the fact that they have, the Corinthians have spoken to him in the past, whether it be through a letter or some other means. It's very likely a letter that they had written to Paul. And in that letter, they had likely talked about spiritual gifts. And so Paul is addressing kind of the letter that he had written, or they had written him, and we don't know what was in that letter, or what they said about the spiritual gifts, but what we do know is Paul is now, in the next three chapters, really going to be launching into addressing and really correcting some of the practices and things that they were believing about the spiritual gifts. So you could say that Paul is about to launch into a, an instruction and correction to the church regarding how they understood and operated in the spiritual gifts. So for us as a church, and we are a continuationist church, we believe in the gifts for today, what Paul's about to say is significant. Because it's, we want the word of God to be our, our lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, like we we want God's word to be our guide in terms of how we understand and operate in the spiritual gifts. We want the word of God to show us how we're to, to live out and, and operate in these gifts. And so Paul's about to give instruction and give us some, some important instruction and teaching on this and some correction to the church in Corinth. 
He doesn't want them to be uninformed. We don't want to be uninformed. So what I'm going to do over the next few weeks is I'm actually going to, we're going to, we're going to look in through just chapters 12 and 13 and 14. We're going to preach through these three important chapters that were, will be so helpful to us to give us, I, I, I'm praying and hoping that will bring us together in, in kind of unity for understanding how we're to operate in these spiritual gifts. Then in verse 2 he says, You know that when you were pagans you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. So he's pointing to the fact that before they came to Christ, they worshipped false gods, they worshipped idols. And the whole idea of mute idols is simply a false god, a created god doesn't speak. It was almost like a, a way to kind of make fun of the fact that these created idols, they don't, they don't talk, they're nothing, they're, they're false gods. But you were following these false gods in your former life as pagans. But now, in verse 3, and this is really a complex statement that Paul says, but I think it's absolutely foundational for us. He says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, what is Paul talking about there? Because, for one, I, you know, I think it's pretty obvious, or it should be obvious, that he's not like literally saying something that's meant to be taken literal. Because if he was just meaning for something to be taken literal, then any person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit couldn't say Jesus is Lord. That doesn't make sense. So when you come to Scripture, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't say Jesus is Lord? Well, anybody can say Jesus is Lord. Anybody can say that. Or someone who has the Holy Spirit can't say Jesus is accursed. Well, I like to think that I have the Holy Spirit and I just said it. You know, so like it's not meant to be taken literal. But what he is doing is he's highlighting something significant. He's talking about what is really true spirituality? What it means to be a spiritual person is to be someone who in the Holy Spirit is submitting to Jesus and His Lordship. Because if you say that you're in the Holy Spirit and you're a Spirit-filled person, but Jesus is not Lord of your life, then you're not a Spirit-filled person. You're not in the Spirit if Jesus is not Lord of your life. You can't. And for someone who's pagan, if you think about the old lives that the pagans lived, they, they lived as though Jesus was accursed. Their lifestyles were sinful. That Jesus wasn't Lord of their lives. But when they came to Christ and submitting to Christ, that's when Jesus becomes Lord. And if you're going to say that you're a spiritual person, well then, Jesus should be Lord of your life. And remember, the context of this is spiritual gifts. He's saying now concerning spiritual gifts. And then he talks about the fact that if you're going to say that you're really spiritual, well then, Jesus is Lord of your life. That's how you can gauge one's spirituality in one sense. Now, what's interesting is if you go to Matthew chapter 7, 22, what I find interesting about this passage is that these individuals, well, let me just read it and then we'll, I'll comment it on here. But in Matthew 7, 22, it says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Isn't that interesting that they start off by saying, Lord, Lord, to Jesus. So right here we have a confession with their mouth that, Lord, Lord, yeah, you're, you're Lord. We did these things in your name. But then look what Jesus says, you workers of lawlessness, they were not... Jesus wasn't Lord of their life. Maybe on their lips, but their actions didn't support their speech. 
Their actions didn't line up with their lifestyle. That if they said that Jesus was Lord, but they were living lawlessness, they were living in sin, then it wasn't true. And so the Corinthians who were as we'll find out, we're a a spiritually gifted church who are operating in spiritual gifts, but we're actually quite immature. And they were, I believe they were thinking of themselves more highly than they thought because of the fact that they were operating in these gifts. But Paul almost in one sense is saying, listen, when we're going to talk about spiritual gifts, we need to understand something that spiritual maturity, being in Christ, having the Spirit, means that you're submitting to Jesus as Lord. And that your spiritual giftedness is not a reflection, a reflection of your spiritual maturity. And I know I've shared this before at Harmony, but I, I believe that it's relevant, and especially as we move into the spiritual gifts, and I'll say it again, a spiritually gifted The Corinthians were a spiritually gifted, immature church. 1 Corinthians 1.7, Paul says, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. They didn't lack any spiritual gift. They were a spiritually gifted church. But then in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1, he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. They were an immature church, yet also spiritually gifted. Now, I just want to highlight for you some of the issues that are going on in this church. Because it's concerning. Let me just uh, highlight for you some of these things. In chapter 1, there's quarreling and divisions. In chapter 3, there's jealousy and strife. In chapter 4, puffed up with pride. In chapter 5, sexual immorality and incest. Chapter 6, lawsuits and sleeping with prostitutes. They were suing one another, their brothers and sisters. And there were some that were sleeping with prostitutes. Chapter 7, marrying Marriage partners were withholding sex from one another. Chapter 10, worshiping idols. Chapter 11, they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. And on top of that, some who were depending on the Lord's Supper for nourishment and sustenance, there were people that were coming in and eating all the food and leaving nothing for the poor. It was just, and because of that, the Lord brought judgment and discipline upon them. So here we have this church, I mean, chapter 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, you have all these issues that are going on in this church, and if you think about it, like if you were to hear about any of these kinds of issues in any other church, you'd be like, yeesh, that's not good. You know, if Harmony was known for having all these issues going on, the reality is, is you probably wouldn't be like, ooh, I'm going to tune in to check out what's going on there, and what the teaching is going on there, that's a... You wouldn't, you'd be like, e, that's a bad place. Like, Lord, God's got to do some work there. God's got to do some stuff. But what happens, and this is a, a warning, there's a couple warnings that we can, we can draw from this that I think need to be spoken. And, and especially as we move into talking about the gifts of the Spirit, there's some warnings that are that are, I think need to be said. And the first is there's a warning against pride. A warning against pride. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 6. Uh, Paul talking to the church in Rome, uh, talking about gifts, of the, again, talking about spiritual gifts. He says this. He says, For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. 
And so Paul talking about kind of the gifts that God gives to his church and there were some who were thinking of themselves more highly because of certain gifts that they had. And Paul's saying, no, we are all part of the body of Christ and God has sovereignly given. And as we move forward in Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, we'll see that God sovereignly chooses to give gifts to his church. But these gifts, the word gift there in verse 6 is charisma. That's where the whole idea of charismatics come from, the gifts of the Spirit. The word is charisma, and it literally means a free gift. It's a gift of grace. So if you have a spiritual gift, it's because God has sovereignly chosen to, chosen to give it to you. You didn't earn that. And yes, it says that we're to eagerly pray for the spiritual gifts. But even in that, you can pray for all of them, but it's God who's going to sovereignly choose to give you what he decides to give you. And it's a gift that he gives you. It's nothing that you can earn. So there is no room for pride in this conversation about spiritual gifts. This whole idea that if I have multiple spiritual gifts, it means that I'm like a super Christian. It's ludicrous. And I could say even argue for the opposite, that those that, who have multiple spiritual gifts may actually be quite immature, as is the church in Corinth. Spiritual giftedness is not a sign of Christian maturity. Spiritual gifts were sovereignly given to the church for His glory and for upbuilding, for the building up of the church, encouraging one another. Again, in 1 Corinthians 12, 21, and we'll look at this a, you know, just a, a few weeks from now, but it says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. As in, you know, well, I've got these things, what do I need that person for? What do I need, you know, this idea of pride that we don't need one another. We need one another. That we are not the body if we're all broken off into pieces and separate. We are a body when we are together, when we're understanding our need for one another. And so some have gifts that are more, maybe you could say sign gifts, more seen, you know, the prophetic gifts of tongues with interpretation of tongues, um, gifts of miracles or gifts of healing, these kind of things are more prominent, more seen as opposed to maybe gifts of helps or gifts of administration or these types of things that are more in, in the background. But does that mean that one person is more important than another person? Absolutely not. We're all needed. We're all valued equally. And even, you know, the pastor or the leaders or the elders, we're not more valuable to God in his eyes. We're all together. We're all needed one another to, to link arms together. And they're really, we need to protect ourselves from pride. And, and obviously we're going to, this will be dealt with more as we move on. But I just issue an, a warning to, the, to us as we think about the spiritual gifts. Let it never be that, that pride would enter into our lives or thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought because of certain spiritual gifts that we have. The second warning that I want to issue in relation to the spiritual gifts is a warning of improper focus. When we talk about the spiritual gifts, and as we will be talking about the spiritual gifts, we're going to focus on them. The Bible says that we're to eagerly desire the, you know, the spiritual gifts. So yes, we as a church, to be faithful, we want to, we want to desire them, but there is a danger that we can become off focus when it comes to the issue of spiritual gifts. Because when you think about it, spiritual gifts are exciting. I mean... Yes, they are exciting. I mean, think about prophecy. Prophecy is, is God speaking to you to encourage someone else with just words that can really lift up and comfort and exhort. And, and there's a real, there's an excitement to that. And if you've ever have, have been given a prophetic word, it's just like, whoa, it's, it's powerful. If you've ever been a part of a, a service where people have been healed, physically healed, it's exciting. If you've seen miracles, like those things are exciting. There, there is an excitement that, that absolutely is, is, 
is there in the spiritual gifts, in some of the maybe more um, sign gifts, if you could categorize them as that. There is excitement, but the problem is, is that in the excitement, we begin to pursue the gifts for the sake of the excitement. We begin to pursue the gifts above the giver. You see, the gifts are, are to direct us to Him. That our eyes are, remember, at the beginning, that your focus needs to be on Christ, on Him. And, and I guess if you could summarize it as Paul does, at the end of these three chapters on the gifts, at the beginning of chapter 5, Paul says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, so he's having spoken about the spiritual gifts, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Caiaphas, then to the twelve, of first importance, Christ died for our sins. Paul's bringing them back to what needs to be the most important thing is the gospel. Is our eyes are on Jesus. That our sins have been forgiven. This is what we are thankful for, eternally thankful for. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. If God never does anything for you ever again, but all He did for you was forgive you of your sin, you have every reason to be thankful every day of your life. Of first importance is the gospel. This isn't, you know, we, we start with the gospel and then we move on into maturity. That's not what he's saying. That the gospel is our foundation. It's where we, we live from. There's our forgiveness of sin. That Christ is raised from the dead. And out of that focus and place that we, we live from, the gifts will follow. They'll trail behind us. They'll, they'll be seen. They, they will manifest themselves as we walk with the Lord. But they're not to be our focus. And I have a grave concern for churches that, that are so focused on the gifts of the Spirit. And even we as believers can fall prey to this, that we can start to think of churches that are gifted churches as being Spirit-filled churches. Well, if we see prophecy and if we ha see healing and we see signs and wonders, well, that's where the Spirit is. Well, I wonder, would you think that way about Corinth? After having listed all the issues and problems, would you think about, man, I want to go to that church? You'd be like, I don't want to go there. Like, tolerating incest and sexual immorality. People are sleeping with prostitutes. People are getting drunk on the Lord's Supper. Like, that's a place that you'd want to avoid. But yet, we in Christianity, we often will assume that the spiritually gifted churches is where the Spirit is operating. But my question is, where is their focus? Are they submitting to the Lordship of Christ? Is their lives wholly devoted to Jesus in His purposes, in His will? Are they, is Jesus Lord? Because that to me is more of a sign of spiritual maturity than whether you can prophesy or whether you can speak in tongues. Is your life submitted to the Lordship of Jesus and you're like, Lord, whatever you want from my life, let it be. And so we need to be careful, especially with these people that are promoting and, and pumping spiritual gifts as like, listen to me because look at what's happening here. We, sometimes, we need to look past that. Okay, okay, okay may, may, it may be that God is moving and it may be that God is doing some wonder, wonderful things and that the church is submitting to Christ and He is Lord But that's not the measure. That's not the first measure that we look towards. That we need to be careful. And further, I want to extend kind of, this is a final warning and something that concerns me deeply as a pastor, as something that I've been observing in the church. And it's related to spiritual gifts, but it's also 
related a little bit. It's a little bit separate, so that you could almost say this is a little bit of a Dan, a Pastor Dan's, uh, as a shepherd's heart, as a pastor, this is a warning that I have, a, a concern that I have, that's kind of connected to this topic, but a little bit not, and you'll kind of see why here. But I want to point out to you uh, something that I read recently by a, a charismatic kind of revivalist preacher. Let me read for you this. And he said, he wrote this recently, put it on his Facebook, and it was kind of his vision for 2021. And this is what he said. He says, the purpose of this letter is to share some of the things that we are moving forward with that the Lord has made clear. It was the last summer in July of August of 2020 that I had a series of angelic encounters, visions, and personal encounters with the Lord that were absolutely life-changing. And he further writes, during this awesome season of almost daily personal encounters with the Lord, that God spoke to me. So just reading that off the hop, you can see like, wow, that's, that's pretty powerful. I mean, he's, he's saying here, you know, a series of angelic encounters and visions and personal encounters with the Lord that were absolutely life-changing, daily personal encounters with the Lord. Have you ever prayed for a, an encounter with the Lord? I mean, like desiring that for your life? You, could, you almost read that and be like, I'd be happy with like one in a year. And that this guy's getting it all the time. Whoa, like... I want to hear what he's got to say, right? Who is this guy? This guy's name's Todd Bentley. And uh, you may not know Todd Bentley, but Todd Bentley recently was, was disqualified from ministry for basically over the last 15 years of, of, of sexual adult, uh, adultery, sexting, substance abuse. He was doing revival meetings while drunk. He left his wife and his children uh, cheating on her with an intern. While he was at school of ministry, he was texting both male and females propositions for, for, for sex. He, it's a disgrace. His life is filled with just sinfulness and debauchery. And yet here he is launching into 2021, talking about how the Lord was just daily encountering the presence of the Lord. And you know what's interesting is that this is what's happening, is prophets or whoever you want to call, people online or these different people, will, will preach their experience, their encounters, their visions. And it's that, it's those things that are their credentials. Because you could ask, how in the world could Todd possibly continue on in, in ministry He's been condemned by, you know, all, all different charismatics and like universally everyone in the church says he's not qualified and fit for ministry. How, he can, can, how can he continue to go on? It's because he had these visions, these encounters. And you know what? People will look past all of his previous life and they'll be drawn to just this. Well, he's had encounters. He's had visions. He's had these experiences. And we are credentialing people based on their visions and encounters and their experiences with the Lord. And I don't know, I personally think if the Lord was speaking to Todd in the way that he says that it, God is speaking to him, the Lord would be saying to repent, to step down, to humble yourself, to never step behind a pulpit again. That he has been disqualified. So I don't know, I don't know if this is just pure lies or if this is demonic or what's happening here. But there's a concern that I have for those that are preaching their visions, preaching their dreams, preaching their encounters, that these, this, these things are their primary thrust and, and it's attractive to people. You know, oh God, I, I, and, and I've heard people, I, I, even before Todd, you know, fell into every, all the sin or whatever, what I found interesting about Todd is he would preach for hours on his visions, on his dreams, on his encounters. And we need to be very careful with all this stuff. And I believe that God does give us visions and dreams. And I want to talk about, for a second here, the Apostle Paul. Because he had a powerful encounter with the Lord. But I want to highlight his response in talking about it because it's significant and I think it is instructive to us. So Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let me just read 
I'm just going to turn there because my phone is like, the print is like super tiny. So, uh, <laughs> so 2, Cor- 2 Corinthians chapter 12, going to start in verse 2. And we're going to just read about an encounter that Paul had with the Lord, a very powerful encounter. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But... I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. A thorn was given me in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. And I'll just stop there. Now the reason I highlight this is because do you notice how uncomfortable Paul is talking about this? You see, he doesn't even want to talk about it. But he's doing it because he, he, he was instructing the Corinthians and it, it bared relevance to the, the thing that he had to deal with and how he was addressing it. He speaks of himself in the third person. Like, why is he doing that? It's almost like he's like saying, I don't want to talk about this, but I'm going to talk about it because you need to hear it. But he, he, he says, I don't want you guys to think of me more than you ought to think of me. Isn't it interesting that, that when I hear people talking about their visions and their encounters and these experiences, these tremendous experiences, it's like, wow, look at me. But if you look to Scripture and you look at how Paul responded, it's almost like, listen, I don't want this to be a focus. I don't want your attention to be on this. This experience that was very profound, in, in, surpassing revelations it spoke about. And it's like he's, he's weary to talk about it because he doesn't want them thinking more of him than they ought to think or to be puffing him up because of these encounters. And yet, what I see in the church is people doing the opposite. Oh, I had these revelations, these dreams, these things. You know, come hear what God is doing. And it's almost a source of, of boasting. When it should be the reverse. It should be... I don't, we're not going to talk about these things unless the Lord absolutely tells us to, but those are personal things that we should keep between us and the Lord for, for whatever God is doing and why he's revealing those things to you. That's between you and the Lord. And it's almost like a private thing between Paul and God that he's bringing out that he hasn't talked about, but he is because he needs to for instruction purposes. But also on top of that, God gave Paul, a thorn in his flesh to keep him from becoming conceited. You know what's interesting is when I hear about all these people talking about encounters and experiences and all these things, you don't hear them talking about what God did to to humble them afterwards. It's like, where's the thorn in the flesh? We don't like talking or preaching on that. We just like about the visions, the encounters, the angelic, all these, wow, you know, things. Come, listen, hear what God is doing. Look at this man of God, this, this gifted man of God up here. Boasting in our experiences. That we need to be careful that this is not the way for the church, for the body of Christ. And, And as a pastor, as a shepherd, I am very concerned because I see a lot of people falling prey to this this kind of teaching, these kinds of boasting and experiences, encounters. And it's not wrong that we talk about them if God is leading you to directing you, but may it always be done with intense humility, directing people to God and not to the the prophet or the, the, the evangelist or the great person up here. No, we are we're nothing apart from him. And every gift that we have has been sovereignly given to us by God. And it's not a sign of your spiritual elite level. It's a sign of His mercy and grace. It, it should, we, our eyes should always be on Christ and on Him. Focusing on Him at all points. Never directing our, our attention away from Him. And if, if I ever get to a place where I start you know, 
talking about how great I am at this or that, kick me out of here. That's not my heart. That's not my goal. My, I want your eyes on Jesus. Don't, you don't remember me so good? Thank goodness. Remember God. He's the one that can heal and save and redeem. And so our focus needs to be on Christ. And so, yes, as we move into the spiritual gifts, we're going to be focused on Christ and pursuing His glory and His good. And we're going to talk about the gifts, but it's always going to be for His glory. That's where it needs to remain. That's where our, our, our foundation needs to be. And so, all this content that's available out there right now, because right now you could literally go and listen to anything, like any church. Most churches are online right now. That pandemic has, has created an influx of online church, you know. You can go and listen to anybody all over the world. All tons of material, teaching, and some of it's really good. And I would encourage you to, to don't just listen to me. There's amazing preachers and pastors and teachers that are phenomenal, that can encourage you and build you up. Listen, have a diverse, you know, just uh, sermon archives or whatever you want to get. Like, it's good to be listening to lots of people, not just listening to Daniel here. But also with the good, there comes a host of bad. A host of bad. You can go online, YouTube, and you can listen to sermon after sermon after sermon that is awful, brutal. And it's not anchored in the Word. It's not focused on God. It's focused on man. It's focused on prosperity. It's focused on the gifts with no mention of the giver. And we need, to, we need to have our focus in the right place. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of shysters. A lot of greedy people that are looking for your money and they know what draws you in. It's not, let's open the Bible and look at this scripture verse. It's listen to the encounter that I had with the Lord last night. You're going to get a lot more lick, likes and clicks preaching an encounter over just preaching we're just going to preach from the word, verse, verse by verse. And I was listening to these two YouTubers talk about it just the other day, two Christian YouTubers talking about the fact that they know that when they just do Bible studies, it's, you know, online, they don't get a lot of clicks, they don't get a lot of likes. But the moment they start talking about controversial stuff or, you know, these kind of sign things, you know, lots of clicks, lots of likes, lots of attention. And so, my hope is that Harmony Community Church would be just as interested in the Bible study link and click on YouTube as the guy who had the angelic vision. That, that we would be more interested in the Bible study than some guy's angelic vision and him talking about it and then asking you to give to his ministry. That we need to be very careful with what we're listening to and who we're drawing from because what I see in this letter, and as we move forward, we need to remember, this is an immature church that was spiritually gifted. So, let's be careful about draw and wanting to listen to these people that are talking about all the gifts on prophecy, and, and I see this on, on Facebook. Join in the meeting, you know, I'm going to have a prophetic word for you. Where you're, you know, people are going to get healed, you know, these promises of all these, these things. Friends, if anybody can promise you prophecy, oh, like be, no. I can't say that God is going to speak to you. I can't say that. I remember Pastor Bruce said it, and, and I, I thought it was powerful, but he said anybody who promises you that they're going to prophesy over you, that's borderline witchcraft. It's borderline witchcraft. I cannot tell you what God is going to say to you. That's me saying to God, you're going to tell me what... You know, that's not how it works. We, 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 we sit in quiet and we listen and we ask the Lord, is there anything that you have to say? And we wait. And if God says something, we, well, okay, God, I, God is you know, speaking, saying this to me. I can't tell God what to say or when he's going to say it. So if somebody is on, the fa on Facebook or whatever and they're saying they've got a prophetic word for you, just tune in. 
tune out. Tune out. No. And I, I'm not against charismatics. I'm not. I, am, I consider myself a charismatic. But unfortunately, in the charismatic realm, maybe more the hyper-charismatic realm, there's a lot of this stuff that's, that's, that's floating around, talking about gifts above the giver, focusing on experience above the Word of God, and, and studying the Word, and preaching visions and dreams, and not even looking and opening the Scriptures. Yeah, I have a concern, a deep concern, as your pastor, as someone who cares about the, the sheep, that, that you guys would be absorbing good teaching and good doctrine. And there is charismatics out there that have good teaching and good doctrine. And, and so I'm not against charismatics. Don't hear me, don't say that. I mean, even as we move into this series, you're going to see that there are some things that I believe that the church is not doing that we can be doing better, like walking in the prophetic, like believing that God still heals and wants to use his church to see people healed. And there's just a host of things that I think that God is wanting to stir in us, but before we can bring us to that place, he needs to know that our focus is in the right place. And it's on Christ. It's submitting to God. It's the Lordship of Jesus, and the first importance is the gospel, and our attention and our focus are on Him, and that's where we, that's where we anchor ourselves, and that's where this kind of message is a launching point into the gifts, is we're going to anchor ourselves here as we move into the gifts. And I believe that if we can remain anchored in this place, that God will bless His church with manifestations of His Spirit. So, Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that, that, that Jesus, that whatever is of you, whatever is of truth, may it sink into our hearts and may it move us to just want to know you more, want to dive deeper into the word, to, to just go after you, to hunger for you. And Jesus, as we move forward in this series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, May our eyes always be laser focused on you. May our lives be about your glory. And may the gifts that you manifest through your church build up your church so that we would just be more focused and more in love with you. And God, I, I, I understand that, that I'm just, I'm a flawed guy, Lord. I'm, I'm, I don't have all the, the greatest education or I don't have it all together, Lord, but I pray that you would use me to be faithful in exposing your word, to be faithful in in guiding us as we seek to walk out the gifts of the Spirit. And it's not just me, Lord. I know there are many people at Harmony Church that have been gifted, that have great knowledge and wisdom that, that I'm hoping that we as a community together can walk in these things together, to learn together, to grow together, that we would be united in our focus and in our practice. We want to be a church that, that operates in the gifts of the Spirit. That seeks to honor you and look to you and glorify you and submitting to you. And that of first importance is the gospel that we stand upon, that we live from. And so may you bless us as we endeavor to, to understand, to go deeper, bring clarity and unity to your church, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to the live stream. Um, also, I want to just give a little a mini announcement that uh, it's very likely that we will be having service at 30% capacity next Sunday. Um, so if you would like to come to church Sunday morning, 
Um, we'd love to have you. We have 50, 50 people we can, we can get in here with kind of the social distancing and all that. So if you'd like to come, you'd like to be a part of Sunday morning service, uh, we'd love to have you. Would you just please let Carol or I know if you're able to come, because we do have 50 people. Um, so I would hope that there would be more than 50, because I know there is some that are willing to stay home for those that are wanting to come. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to accommodate. And, you know, hopefully we just, we, more people and more people want to come, that we have, have, we have to have multiple services. So maybe we'll do that. As God grows his church, we can, we'll be doing multiples. So that, that'll be good. But please let us know. Um, sign up, I guess, if you could say. Uh, we also want to leave some room for drop-ins as well. So if you just want to come, we can, we can handle that as well. Um, excited to, to hopefully see some more of your faces next Sunday. Uh, God bless you guys as you go this week. Um, may his spirit and grace just rest upon you. Uh, may you have a wonderful, wonderful week. God bless you guys.